Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Global Symposium Series with Dr. Michael Oaken speaking for us today on Parkinson's disease journey from a happy life to emerging therapies. My name is Alana Dillon. I'm an Education and Support Services Coordinator at Parkinson's Society BC, and I'll be facilitating our webinar today. Before I introduce Dr. Oaken, I'd like to go through a few housekeeping items with you. Uh, first, I want to let you know that we are recording this webinar and it will be available on our website along with the slides, um, usually in about a week, sometimes a little bit earlier than that. Uh, secondly, you will see uh, a chat icon at the bottom of your screen. Click on that icon to open up the chat window and you can use uh, this chat box to type your questions and comments for Dr. Oaken and, and uh, the end of his presentation. And finally, to optimize your experience with this webinar, please ensure that you adjust your speaker volume both on your computer as well as on your actual speaker so that you can hear the webinar well. It is my pleasure to now introduce Dr. Michael Oaken. We are very fortunate to have him speak for us today. Dr. Oaken is an internationally renowned movement disorder specialist and researcher, recognized as a top leading authority on Parkinson's disease. Dr. Oaken obtained his MD with honors from the University of Florida. He completed residency in neurology and was the chief resident at the University of Florida. He was fellowship trained by Malin DeLong, Gerald Batek, and Ray Watts at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, before moving to found the Movement Disorders Program at the University of Florida. He is currently Chair of Neurology, Professor and Director of the Norman Fixell Institute for Neuro Neurological Diseases at the University of Florida Health College of Medicine. The University of Florida Institute he co-founded with Kelly Foote, MD, is unique in that it is comprised of 123 interdisciplinary faculty members from diverse areas of campus, 35 departments, all of whom are dedicated to care, outreach, education, and research. Dr. Oaken was instrumental in the construction of a one-stop patient-centered clinical research experience for national and international patients seeking care at the University of Florida. This change in care and research delivery has since been named the Service and Science Hub Model of Care. The University of Florida-based center draws national and international visitors interested in deploying this innovative clinical research model. Dr. Oaken has served as the National Medical Director Advisor for the Parkinson's Foundation since 2006 and as a medical advisor for Tyler's Hope for a Dystonia Cure since its inception. He has been supported by grants from the National Institutes of Health, the Smallwood Foundation, the Tourette Association of America, the Parkinson Alliance, the Bachman Strauss Foundation, the Parkinson's Foundation, and the Michael J. Fox Foundation. His research has been wide ranging and he is best known for his exploration of various aspects of deep brain stimulation and neuromodulation. Dr. Oaken has been an integral part of some of the pioneering studies exploring the cognitive, behavioral and mood effects of brain stimulation. And since 2005, his laboratory has been working to uncover the electrical brain signals associated with uh, human tick. Dr. Oaken holds the Adelaide Lackner Professorship in Neurology and has published over 400 peer-reviewed articles, 80 review articles, and 14 books. He is a poet, Lessons from the Bedside, 1995, and his book, Parkinson's Treatment, 10 Secrets to a Happier Life, was translated into over 20 languages. His most recent books are Ending Parkinson's Disease, and living with Parkinson's disease. Dr. Oaken was recognized in a 2015 White House ceremony by the Obama administration as a champion of change for Parkinson's disease. Dr. Oaken, thank you so much for being here with us today to do your talk. I will pass it over to you now. Great, fantastic. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you today. And I appreciate the, the warm welcome. Um, I am in a warm climate, as it turns out. And so this technology is beautiful. We've been stranded here since March 2020. Um, had my first trip out just last week as a visiting professor. So 
been uh, pretty much doing homework with my kids every night and getting to know my family better for the last two or three years. And I know a lot of you have been stuck um, at home and being at home isn't awesome for Parkinson's disease. And we can talk about that too, as we head along today and, and, and have a journey together. I wanna to recognize the Parkinson's Society of British Columbia. I wanna recognize Alana Dillon for, uh, for working with me too. My, my schedule is actually um, uh, really uh, crazy with COVID because we have eight different neurology services here plus the, the Norman Fixell Institute and, um, and a ton of, um, of relief efforts going on here throughout the state of Florida in the, in the last um, two plus years. And so it's good to be out. It's good to be talking to you today. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take you on a bit of a journey. We're going to have uh, a little bit of fun. We're going to talk about uh, Parkinson disease and we're going to talk about journey, journey from a happy life and into uh, emerging therapies and I never um, talk to a, uh, a Parkinson disease group without um, without first uh, acknowledging that you know it would be foolish to not have in your pocket at least a discussion ready to talk about all the new things and all the emerging things. And so, as we take our journey and and we remember philosophically when we we talk about taking a journey together, I want you to to keep in mind that um, that there are two aspects to this. One aspect is we believe that you can have a happy and a great life with Parkinson. And the other aspect is, uh, is, is what are going to be those emerging therapies that are going to bring the hope and the, and the next generation. And, and I'll remind people that there's a very famous Chinese philosopher, Lu Jun, and Lu Jun said that before there were roads, there had to be people to walk on them. And so we invite everybody with Parkinson, all their families, all the people affected, Alana Dillon, all of the, the great people that you have there to walk together on the road and, um, and together, all organizations together. You know, I've worked with all the organizations and uh, it's, it's just important that we, we, come, we come together. So this is where I am from in case you're in Florida and I don't wanna make too big of a joke about this, but it turns out a lot of Canadians end up in Florida for various reasons that we know about. And so if you end up in Florida, we're about two hours due north on Interstate 75 uh, from Disney World. You're welcome to uh, visit us. We kind of have an all under one roof Institute for Parkinson disease and movement disorders. And then we also opened a brand new neuromedicine hospital. You're always welcome to, to come by and visit us. Um, we have a Twitter account, um, just at my name. If you wanna ask questions, we have all sorts of great discussions on Twitter and, and, um, and other medias. And then Indu Subramanian from UCLA is, is the only doc I know that's certified both in movement disorders and Parkinson and also in integrative medicine, along with Johnny Atchison, who is a a doctor who has Parkinson disease from the UK and is a gifted artist. Together we run this, you know, I think it's fun for us. It's, a, it's an outlet where we get to get to just communicate tips and do expert interviews and talk about things with the community called parkinsonsecrets.com. So you're welcome to, to, um, to catch up with us on any of these mediums. And you can also catch me on the Parkinson Foundation as well. Now, I don't have to convince anyone that we been living through a pandemic, but it turns out that um, in the middle of the pandemic, this book that you see, Ending Parkinson's Disease, came out. And this, um, this book was actually uh, originally titled The Parkinson Pandemic. And, and the publisher changed the title. And for those of you that do writing, you know, the publishers and the editors oftentimes will change your words uh, around. And, and, uh, and I think that, that uh, that's a reasonable thing. Uh, but uh, but I think they they would have loved to have uh, to have kept that original title and um, and the idea that we think about Parkinson disease as a pandemic is because it affects everyone all continents no one's necessarily immune it affects men it affects women and it actually meets all of the criteria and the amount of growth that we'll talk about has been you know extremely brisk and it's something that we worry about and. It can collapse not only the American healthcare system and the Canadian healthcare system, but healthcare systems all over the world if we actually don't get a hold of this. And so we wrote this book and then also a number of you, I know in British Columbia are, uh, are part of um, efforts and particularly 
uh, one of our great heroes, superheroes is Larry Gifford, and we call him the GIF, who's, you know, from your neck of the woods there, after we wrote the book, really began to, to pull together this grassroots group of people called the Parkinson Disease Avengers. They have 5,000 of them. We met a bunch of them at the Parkinson Unity Walk a few weeks ago, and walking together to end Parkinson. And we also came together for a red card campaign where we said we need to do a few things with the new White House administration, and we sent thousands and thousands of, of cards to the White House to try to ban chemicals like Paraquat, make sure that we keep um, telehealth alive in the US. You all have been smart with telehealth in Canada for a long time, and so we, we need to catch up uh, with you. And then to increase the funding by 10 times, uh, and we just need to widen that funnel. And we'll talk about that as we get to, to more therapies. And then the other book that recently came out <clears throat> during the pandemic was this Living Parkinson's Disease book, Living With It, with Irene Malati and Wissam Deeb. Wissam Deeb is now moved his faculty from the University of Florida, one of our graduates up to the University of Massachusetts. And, um, and so this has a lot of tips. It's kind of like a cookbook and it's done by the Robert Rose Company and they, they are famous for their cookbook. So they really helped us to design it, to give away tips. And those of you that like, um, you know, to have like little tips and little tidbits and things that, you know, like bonus questions and things, then, then I think you'll enjoy, you know, kind of our interactions because that's kind of how I look at it. There are all sorts of little things and we need to help people along their road. And that's the part of the journey to a happy life. And then we can talk about the hope and the things that are going on with trials. So we'll try to take you on a nice, uh, a nice walk together. We have done the impossible before. The suffering we experienced, it pushed us forward. It did not stop us. Stigma was there. Our brothers and sisters marched on the streets until it wasn't. The challenge inspired us. Together, we rose to the occasion. We fought back. And we will do it again. We will end Parkinson's. Our fight begins now. We have done, we have done, we have done the impossible before. Let's see if I can flip to the next slide. There we go. So Parkinson disease, you know, as a, as a construct, when we wrote the book with Boston Bloom from the Nyman Jan in the Netherlands, and, um, and also with Ray Dorsey, who is the lead author, who's in Rochester, who's very into environmental science. And Todd Scherer, who at the time was the CEO of the Michael J. Fox Foundation, is now in charge of, of their, of their, um, some of their scientific um, development. The idea is, is that, you know, we need to think about what it is, what other groups have done before, and how are we going to be able to get a hold of the problem. And the problem is big. And in fact, we know, and a number of us, including the GIF from your area, Larry Gifford, are part of that World Health Organization, group that you know has begun to look at the problem and we now know that parkinson disease is the fastest growing neurological disorder and that should grab your attention and we look particularly at men it's a more male predominant disease but it, it affects men and women okay it affects all races all ethnicities you don't there's no potential immunity anybody could get this okay and so there are one in 15 people are going to get it in a lifetime so if you're in a um, if you're in a group, okay, and like a, a classroom, usually classroom sizes are 20 or 30 people, then one or two people that you know are going to get Parkinson in a lifetime, and that's a lot. And when we look at the projections, if we just take a peek at 15-year um, epics here, and so this is, um, this is actually in 25-year epics, um, sorry, from 1990 to 2015, you can see a more than doubling of the cases of Parkinson. And then the next 25-year epic from 2015 to 2040, it doubles again, okay? And so this has the potential for disaster, not just from hip fractures, not just from, uh, from uh, other um, issues that can come up, not just from hospitalization, but it can also collapse healthcare systems when you're going to have to to deal with this much disability. And so there's, there's not just a reason to pursue this for a happy life. There's a reason to pursue this 
from a societal the costs to society. And so when we began to study Parkinson's disease and to study and to say, hey, maybe we can't end Parkinson's disease tomorrow. And maybe Parkinson isn't one disease. And in fact, when we wrote an article for The Lancet, um, Boston Bloom, one of the co-authors, he, he suggested to Lancet editors, we call it Parkinson's diseases because it's not one disease. But as we look at this and we start to think, okay, well, how about other diseases, other places where we've seen people reach and get to cures or get to ending? And I, I use the C word very cautiously. You'll, you'll hear me very, very few times use it. But in a construct of thinking about if you were going to strive to get all the way there, at least with certain forms of Parkinson, where have we seen this happen? And so we studied other diseases and we realized that there was a formula. And we called that formula the PACT. And each letter stands for something. So P stands for prevent. How can you prevent? So that would be things like you see us now in the so post the book. You see all these articles and all these um, you know lawsuits, you know, with Paraquat and other chemicals and things that may be associated. So banning chemicals. We need to become much stronger advocates, like we did for HIV, like we did for for um, for other disorders like polio. And, and in thinking through this, today on our journey, we're talking about a happy life. So we're going to focus on the caring part, the C in the PACT, and the T, the new, the treatments, the emerging treatments for this. So a PACT, prevent, advocate, care, and treat. That is the formula, folks. It's that simple. That's the formula that others in other diseases have taken the road before us. And so I think we need to consider that as the group. And just one more just push on advocacy since the chief advocate uh, is up from your neck of the woods, Larry Gifford, please remember that we need a louder voice. We need to, to, um, to summate our voices. We need to amplify them in order to catalyze change. So today on our journey, we're gonna talk about a bit about care, throw out a few tips, some of the things that we know, some of the things that we need to be thinking about philosophically, and this is part of that journey toward happiness. And I told you many of the recipes we um, gave away um, here in this book, Living with Parkinson's Disease. Robert Rose is actually a, um, a Canadian publisher that's based in Toronto. And if you look on the shelf, like in the shelf of my um, closet that my wife and I, we have all of our cookbooks and stuff, you have Robert Rose cookbooks. And undoubtedly, you probably have at least one or two. So when we think about this, and we were thinking about care, we were thinking about that journey, we realized that a lot of people with Parkinson look like you and me. You can't tell the difference. And, and there's sort of this stigma that you know, people are walking around and lots of people have Parkinson's disease. And so one of the things we wanted to do was introduce each of the chapters by introducing people, like real people, like the people that you see here on the pictures. And, and this, these were taken by Robert Dean, He's actually a retired uh, pathologist, uh, lives in Sarasota, Florida, and Bob's wife died of Parkinson's disease, but capturing the real faces of the real people as they live through this. And our notion of what Parkinson's disease and what the person with Parkinson's disease is, is changing. And gosh, it should change. And I, I love this story that I heard from Johnny Atchison, who's the artist on our blog site, Johnny has Parkinson. He went on vacation and his young daughter was sitting next to him on the airplane and she was playing with Lego. And she said, hey, dad, you know, you look like the Lego man. You're the Lego man. And he said, what do you mean I'm the Lego man? And, and she starts to say, well, look, you have sort of this masked face. Your body's a little bit stiff. You can still walk here. Maybe your steps are a little bit shorter. You've got the Lego hand. You've got a little reduced arm swing. You're a little bit rigid. And Johnny says, gosh, I am the Lego man. You are right. And so Johnny wrote to the Lego company and got permission. And surprisingly, in his words, when he tells the story, got permission to actually draw these nice pictures to help kids and adults to understand both the visible symptoms and the non-motor symptoms and understand that women can get Parkinson. And, and our image of Parkinson is the old man with Parkinson. And, and that is really not the image and not what we should be thinking about. And so we've sort of put forward a new image of Parkinson and actually Melissa Armstrong published that image in JAMA Neurology. And it, it, it means people of all different sizes and forms and genders and, and everybody. And we need to, to get rid of the old 
Gower sketch. And as we move forward toward our path in creating a better world, we have to think of better models of care. And there's not one model that's correct, okay? This is just one example. This is one I know the best because I'm at University of Florida and we use what's called a service and science hub model where we put all the services under one roof. We have each specialist develop a, a patient specific plan of care. We give everybody research opportunities. We give everybody a chance to be a research subject or a clinical subject. And we create a bi-directional relationship and track outcomes and give, give access to clinical trials. The bi-directionality means that your therapists, the people on your team need to be as invested in your case as, as you are and your family is, and they need to be gaining as much from the interaction as you do. So it's bi-directional. So they feel that they're part of the team. This is part of their journey along with, with you. So when you think of better ways to deliver healthcare, these were some of the things that were useful to us. And I always point out and have now been asked many times to give talks about how you do it. And I always say, you do it however it works for your geography, for your region, for what your needs are, for what your healthcare system can offer, what's free in your system, what's not free. And there's lots of tricks to getting you know, these things together. And so this is gonna be important. How you move the chess pieces to provide the care is gonna be important, especially as the number of people explode with Parkinson's. Now, those of you that know me also know that I've been accused of being a broken record. And those of you that are old enough to know what a broken record is, will know uh, what that means. And it means you say the same thing over and over again. So I joined the University of Florida in 2002, 20 years ago. And the philosophy that I say over and over is the person is the sun. We even were able to slip it into this Lancet <laughs> article here that Boston Bloom and Christine Klein, um, we wrote here recently a seminar about Parkinson's disease, putting the person and the family, notice it says person and family as the sun in the center, and then all the people orbit around. And most people with Parkinson, you'll see the next circle there, you know, in green, you'll see some of the things that most people are gonna need like social workers and physical therapists and things. And then some people are gonna need many of these other specialists. And so figuring out how to put the person in the center. And also, by the way, the, 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 the doctor, the physician is not the God. That has to end, not just for Parkinson, but for other diseases. It needs to be the person, needs to be the center, and the family needs to be the center. And so the core philosophy, I think, is really important. And also thinking about virtual, okay? We, we didn't really think much about this. You all are been the leaders. I always uh, cite Canada as the, the, the prime example of leading in healthcare and teaching others and other continents how to do this well. And you're right across the border and we hadn't learned it. And in fact, we kept fighting for it in the US and it wasn't until COVID that we got some telehealth and now we're fighting to, to keep it. But the idea of what can and what can't be done virtually. And the idea also that you'll see a lot of virtual critics. Well, so in difficult cases, maybe you can't make the diagnosis on the, on the screen, but I'll bet you 100 times out of 100 that a person with Parkinson's disease would love to like have you connect with them and help them. And even if you don't have everything you know, totally perfect, you can always get some of it in person, get some help there on the ground just the access to regular, consistent care, okay? Whether you could do every little thing and it's as perfect as you want. Sometimes we don't get perfect in life is a really important thing. And so try to emphasize that to people that, that you know, perfect isn't always the, the answer, but we can do so much with the technology. And when we think about like, how do we provide this? And I know Ms. Dillon was, as she was introducing me, talking about her role in the, in the um, in the, the, the center that you have up there in British Columbia and in that region. It's so important, but it turns out not everyone in every zip code around the, the, um, the world has access to different things. And so one example I always say is the example of a social worker, a counselor, life-changing. I always say if I could hire nine or 10 more social workers, I could hire nine or 10 more social workers, I could keep them busy with our population of Parkinson folks, okay? It's that important. And people say, well, I can't have a social worker. And I say, well, think about it. Think about what's your zip code if you're in the US or your, your postal codes if you're in different areas of the world. What are your state laws and provisions? What are your hospital systems? What are the insurance products? 
you know, are they, are there things, maybe you're a veteran. So are there ways, are there creative ways that you can think of to create value within your healthcare system to get this service provided that's so important? And I think rather than giving up, we need to be helping people to, to try to make that happen. And so here's a, a picture of uh, Carly Rush, who's, uh, who's the, the, the dietitian uh, for our center. And this is another service that a lot of times is not offered to folks with Parkinson, but can be so important just to their health and to their quality of life and to thinking about how they can handle the disease and things like constipation. And also all the things that you hear about that may not be true, okay? You know, and, and so people get on to, to uh, all sorts of crazy diets, they, you know, say you can't drink this, you can drink this. And the reality is, is that you have a degenerative disease. We want you to enjoy your life. So taking things away from you that you're gonna enjoy when there isn't solid evidence to do that, we should really think twice uh, about that and try to create balance and try to create value for people in their lives. And so figuring out how to put social workers and dietitians and genetics counselors and other people into the mix that haven't been there it's going to be really important to the to the quality of life and the quality of people's existence. And so I often give a number of care tips. You know, you know, the first one that I always say is people get worried. You know, what do I have? And when they when you say you have Parkinson, we've learned this over the years that people will interpret this as I have Alzheimer's disease or I have Lou Gehrig's disease or a brain tumor. And it turns out that um, that and, and no, please, no, no. Uh, um, no insult to my friends at the Alzheimer's Association who are awesome and do awesome work for that patient population, but Parkinson is not Alzheimer's and Parkinson is much more livable and you can live a happy life with Parkinson. It's not to say Alzheimer's isn't livable, but it's a different disease and, and people need to understand that. And we need to come to terms with the fact that most people in that first discussion that they're having believe that they're in that category. And it's a different, it's a different disease, has different symptoms and you have a different hope for the type of life. We also have to teach people little tips. And one of the tips that I love is, uh, is this quote that's been done by multiple people. This here again, from one is from Joshua Harris, the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. And, and we have to remember that when we have Parkinson's disease, it's not just whether you have a purple pill or yellow pill or an inhaler or a patch or a DBS or whatever, it's the timing. Timing is critical, and that means we have to actually take the time we have to take 10 minutes and make sure we get the medicines right. And we have to take the time to understand what is the right timing for the medications. And Parkinson is a disease of a group of structures in the brain called the basal ganglia. And that group of structures is, is all about cueing and how things are cued and all about timing, okay? And timing in the treatment is super important. And if you don't pay attention to timing and you think you're gonna solve it with all these new pills and this one lasts longer than that one, or forget about it, okay? You gotta focus on the major philosophy that as things change, you need to change too. And if you don't pay attention to timing in Parkinson's disease, you're not gonna be successful, whether you have the most expensive or the least expensive. Uh, way to go when you're choosing therapies. The other tip I give people is about hospitalization. And this is a great quote. It's a little bit dark by Jared Kintz, who says, I have a favorite cemetery I go to because it's really clean and the doctors and the nurses are all very nice. And we created this, um, this kit, and this is not just me. And in fact, as I speak today, please know that the knowledge that comes from me, the wisdom, if you think some of this is wisdom, comes from the group of people that I've been able to, um, to be around and to touch and who have taught me, okay, over the years. And so this is the Aware and Care Kit. We've done over um, 10 papers on hospitalization and Parkinson disease with the Parkinson Foundation Centers of Excellence, the Parkinson Outcome Project. And remember Florence Nightingale says the very first requirement in a hospital is that it should do the sick no harm. And so the Parkinson's Foundation has given out over 100,000 of these. These are great because you can take them to the hospital with you. And it's like, if you ever packed a bag when you go to the hospital, um, when you're waiting for your first child to be born or your second child or maybe your fifth child, it's great to have that bag ready. And when you go in, it has rip-offs that you can give to the doctors and the nurses that have your medications, they have all the different things that you need to do to survive your hospitalization. 
more than half of people are going to end up in the hospital or the emergency room with Parkinson's disease. And each year that number is going to go, it's going to start out at about a third and then a half, and then it's going to keep going up slowly over time. So you inevitably are going to have to deal with that part of the healthcare system and they are not ready to deal with you. So you need to be the advocates to teach them how to do things to keep yourself safe. So with your medicines and, and, uh, and with your care. talk about tips with exercise and rehabilitation. Um, one thing that I'd like to, uh, to share with you is that, um, that bad therapy, any type of bad therapy is worse than no therapy at all. Bad therapy is worse than any. So we see this because people get their new prescription pads, particularly young doctors that just come out of training, but even doctors who have been around for a while, they just write physical occupational speech and swallow. If you're not getting the right plan that's tailored to you with Parkinson, you're probably getting the wrong therapy. And Kelvin Au, who is one of our fellows who's now at Kansas University, he's actually Canadian. He's from Calgary. He trained at Calgary before. Kelvin wrote a very important paper that was just published in the journal Parkinsonism and Related Disorders, showing that spacing out physical therapy was better than giving it as a burst. And most people, when they prescribe physical therapy, just give a burst and stop. Spacing out the same number of visits over the course of a year or over six months seems to be a much better approach with Parkinson's. So bad therapy, bad planned therapy that's not made specific for Parkinson, not as good. If you're coughing when you're eating, this is another little pearl. If you cough when you eat, the, the food may be going down the wrong, <laughs> the wrong tube and that should immediately prompt swallows. We don't do uh, enough swallow studies in Parkinson disease. And remember, swallow studies in Parkinson disease are important because aspiration pneumonia and aspiration getting food particles down into your lungs, one of the most common causes of hospitalization and of death in Parkinson's disease is pneumonia. So we need to work on those things and be proactive, be preventative. And we saw recently, this is uh, off of my Twitter feed, for those of you that, that, um, that like Twitter, we do a lot of debates and dialogues and science and put a lot of things up and tips and things. And so you're welcome to join join us uh, on the Twitter feed. And, and there's a number of us that exchange. I've really enjoyed my time. And one of the papers that we reviewed was recently this paper by the Physical Therapy Association, where they actually published, you know, the levels of evidence for each form of physical therapy, from flexibility to walking to cueing and showing how these things can be beneficial. And not surprisingly, you know, several of these things like delivering physical therapy with a group of specialists around you, integrative therapy had diamonds. So the number of diamonds it gave is the amount of evidence. There were less diamonds for tele like physical therapy and tele things, but guess what? They're not used to yet doing it in that way. And so there, there may be things as we evolve and learn how to do this better and to make it more specific. The other thing is, is asking very simple questions. Sometimes people make it more complicated than it needs to be. Should I start medications or not when I first start with Parkinson disease? Should I start a medicine for a specific symptom that I get with Parkinson? And I consider myself, even though I've done a lot of science, I consider myself a clinician first, a, a neurologist, a doctor first. And so having these conversations is, is super, super important. And I love the quote by Francis of Assisi, who says, start with doing what, what's, by doing what's necessary, then do what's possible, and suddenly you're gonna be doing the impossible. And so we oftentimes um, reinforce to people because the more papers that come out in the literature, people start to get afraid of some of the old therapies. Dopamine replacement still the best therapy for Parkinson, has not been shown to be toxic to your brain and people have this fear of taking dopamine, you know, especially as new therapies come out, even practitioners, even experts. So we recommend in the Parkinson Foundation, we've written a lot about this, not to become a victim, a, a victim of levodopaphobia. You're not gonna get a gold medal if you delay therapy. And in fact, it could be that you're missing out, you know, if there are symptoms that can improve your quality of life. And then when other symptoms emerge, you have to ask yourself with your team, your doctor and your integrated care team, is it, is it time to start you know, therapy? Should I start or not? You should constantly be asking yourself. That's a natural um, aspect. If you're not asking yourself those questions, then you're probably not being uh, um, you know, integrated enough into your own care. It should all be shared decision-making. And in my clinic, I often say, 
In fact, on every, everybody who's ever seen me as a patient has probably heard me say, I am like your cabinet advisor. I'm only here to give you advice. I will never yell at you. I will never fire you if you do something that, that, um, that I recommend to you. It should be a shared decision making. And the decision is ultimately with the person with Parkinson and with the family. And one of the most exciting areas has been nutrition and the microbiome. And I love a, this quote that's attributed to an unknown author that says, if you don't take care of your body, where are you going to live? If you don't take care of your body, where are you going to live? And I say that be really careful because one of the things people like to publish about, you know, and say things about in the lay press and everything is do this, you know? So for a while I was getting my hair cut yesterday and they were, they were talking about, you know, gluten-free diets were the thing for a while. And, and then, you know, and, and then, so they're asking me about gluten-free diets and then, and then people are getting into ket ketone diets, partial ketosis, full ketosis. There are all sorts of different plant-based diets now. And the reality is, is that there are these organisms, tons of organisms that live normally within your cut, gut and within your gastrointestinal system. We call this sort of um, environment, like it was the underwater sea like environment and, the, and, and all of the sea creatures. You have an environment within your gastrointestinal tract we call the microbiome. It's not the great sea or the great ocean that you'll see in National Geographic, but it's just as complex in a lot of ways. And we don't completely understand that and the relationship to disease, but we've begun to manipulate it by doing experiments in animals and taking away their Parkinson and making their Parkinson come back by changing the microbiome. We're starting to think about milk products. We're starting to think about diets. And we've always been very interested in things like flavonoids. You know, these are like apples, teas, berries, wines. And, and how long you live and mortality with and without Parkinson. And so there may be some benefits and people think like flavonoids have, have um, you know, things that can improve you with inflammation and antioxidants and all those things you see on vitamin commercials. We don't have enough information on all these things yet to be totally firm. So if somebody's being like super firm with you on diet stuff, be a little careful. Okay, remember you're the one that's in charge. Remember you got to enjoy your life. And then there are little tips to enjoying your life. Like if you really love wine, you certainly don't want to get drunk, but maybe you can put a little in the bottom of a glass and just taste that wine without, without it, uh, you know, causing you to, to, you know, impact your balance, you know? So maybe there's a way that you can get access to some of the meals or the things that you love, even if in the rare case, protein is, uh, is getting in the way of your Parkinson. Maybe there's a way to get a little protein in there so you can enjoy some things that you enjoy. So think a little bit broad, more broadly. And I think you're going to see a whole bunch of new therapies coming out that are diet focused, but, um, but we're not quite there yet. So if you think you've solved it yet, let me know, because we could certainly, uh, certainly, uh, um, you know, uh, learn more probably from you. The other thing is neuropsychiatric symptoms. And, and when we think about neuropsychiatric symptoms, there's one that I want you to remember, and that's called demoralization. Now you can become demoralized, which isn't the same as being depressed, which is the largest unmet hurdle in Parkinson. It's not the same as being apathetic and sort of being disengaged, okay? And, and when we think about demoralization, we know it occurs in one in five people with Parkinson, and that should be predictable. But we should be asking about it in our care teams, and we should be addressing it, okay? And we do this now very, very aggressively now because because a lot of times it's treatable and it has nothing to do with depression or anxiety. You gotta ask the people and you've got to address it in order to improve their quality of life. 20% of people are getting demoralized with their Parkinson. We're doing something wrong and we need to, to reach out, identify and help those people. The other thing that I'll tell you is if you happen to be depressed with Parkinson, the majority of you are gonna need an antidepressant at some point in your Parkinson. I don't wanna let the cat out of the bag, but it's important. Parkinson isn't just a disease of dopamine. Remember that when we start an antidepressant, if it's started by a neurologist or a geriatrician, we often set it and forget it. That's what we do, okay? We set it and forget it. That's what a lot of, a lot of people do in the healthcare systems. But if you start an antidepressant, people should be checking on you every few weeks, making sure that we've got the doses titrated and we've got you treated adequately. So also we may be failing in the way that we're using these therapies. And I, I think that's important. And finally, I wanted to bring us to the road of some of the emerging therapies and just 
just introduce to you the concept that there are a lot of people that are waiting for therapies and waiting for the hope and a lot of clinical trials. And of course, people will always say, and I don't want to sound like a broken record, but if you volunteer for clinical trials or for research, that helps us to advance the field uh, faster. We are underfunded. I can use the United States as an example. Uh, when HIV was uh, addressed, it was getting $3 billion a year in the United States. And that amount of money prevented thousands, if not millions of people from ever developing the disease. Parkinson, only 200 million a year, 200, 250 million a year, okay? We gotta increase that investment by more than 10 times. We gotta increase the funnel. We gotta stop fighting each other. You'll see even on Twitter, either on Twitter, people will fight about, oh, they shouldn't give money this or that. I say, make the, the funnel bigger. We learned so much from failures. We learned so much from failures and not everything's gonna be a success. To get to the success, you're gonna to have to fail a lot. Super important concept as we develop new therapies. Why should we fund it? Well, you see the picture here. Many of you know this is carbidopa, levodopa, or cinnamon. Dopamine replacements are still the best treatment for Parkinson's, still the gold standard. The treatment's over 50 years old, and it doesn't stop disease progression. So you can make a pretty good argument. It's time for us to focus. And when we think about some of those therapies that are on the horizon, this gets back to to Boston Bloom's you know, uh, comments about Parkinson's disease not being one disease, to think about what's on the horizon. And when you see those TV commercials where cancers are now being specifically treated by different uh, types of drugs and different targets. So I think you're gonna see over the next decade, a move into more personalized medicine. You see a lot of trials that are going on now, a lot of um, data collection with genetics, a lot of uh, people like the PD generation is one, and the Parkinson Foundation is just one of many examples. Michael J. Fox has a similar trial, you know, where they're collecting a lot of gene data, which we don't have specific genetic treatments yet, but several are in development. So will we be targeting specific genes? And when we see specific gene specific pathways, understand the pathway, understand the circuit, we call it a circuitopathy in the, in the laboratory, all the circuits and how they go, how they are dysregulated. Understand that circuitopathy understand the genetics, understand some of the things that underpin it, make specific therapies for it. And we're seeing these changes in DBS and neuromodulation, specific drugs for specific targets, and then drugs that are out there already. We call those repurposed drugs. So some of these like arthritis drugs you see on TV, it turns out they um, block something called tumor necrosis factor. And when you do that, um, there's several papers. One was in JAMA Neurology, uh, recently, which showed that that may have a decreased amount of Parkinson disease in people who are on those drugs. We need to learn from it. We also need to think about the development of therapies in three different buckets. I always say there's a, a powerful symptomatic bucket. That's bucket one. Bucket two is could we slow disease progression? And bucket three is that elusive C cure bucket. And maybe the cure bucket is more the personalized bucket where we're going to start to go at specific genes first and then specific forms of Parkinson. But one of the things that people have tried for a long time to do is to use medicines like several here that are on this picture, gout medicines, malaria medicines, and change the progression of the disease. If you could slow it down for five or 10 years, you could change the natural course. And also, could you live better? And let me just throw out this idea because many of you may not have thought of this. It's a very simple idea. You'll actually see it even in newspapers and everything, but you might read the article and not stop and just fully appreciate what they're saying. There is a difference between your lifespan, how long you live, and your health span, how long you live well, okay? And so one of the ideas with health span living longer you know, and more well is could you find one of these drugs or repurpose a drug that's already out there to slow the disease progression and live better. So this is a quote by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was a very famous president during the Great Depression in the United States. And he says, one thing, sure, we have to do something. We have to do the best we can know at the moment. If it doesn't turn out right, we can modify it as we go along. We're looking for modifications to a Parkinson, not just cures, not just powerful symptomatic treatments. And the other thing that we've looked at is is, um, is taking these circuits, these abnormal circuits and listening to them. And so this is information about something um, called deep brain stimulation. 
This is something that my lab's been involved with. And I think um, Anna mentioned looking for the physiology for tick or for different disorders that are within the brain, putting leads down, recording out of the brain, trying to figure out what symptoms underpin some of these recordings and using that information to develop new technologies and technologies that could decode the conversation and say, when you see a tremor or you see depression and you see, you know, a, a tick, if you have Tourette and you're a child, then you'll see a, uh, a movement uh, as, as part of that. And, uh, and you'll be able to develop a technology that will change, you know? So let's say this guy has a bit of a tremor and he only needs the device to come on, okay, when he moves and that is called closed loop. So it doesn't even have to be on all the time, but it can detect what is going on. And so this is from an NIH brain initiative study that's ongoing at the University of Florida. And we've worked at things um, in our lab and in Kelly Foote and Icicle Gundes, Christopher Butson and others have worked on these things. Many people, many people in Canada and your region have done cutting edge, great work on this. Andres Lozano, uh, Alberto Fasano and others. Um, so there's great work that's going on in, in newer technologies, thinking about ways that we can do things. And the kids in our lab can take the, um, the devices and the batteries and they can change their software, kind of like your iPhone, and change the way they deliver the pulses too and do all sorts of cool and things. Now, this is a picture of Amado Kuzi, who was a fellow of ours who's at Southern Illinois University. He's a neurologist. And this was a recent paper in Nature Reviews Neurology, looking at several of the newer therapies that are, uh, are beginning to, uh, to come out, okay? And, um, and one of these I'm gonna show you in a moment is where you two take two electrical fields from outside the brain without actually making a craniotomy or a hole in the brain and you're able to stimulate deep in the brain without actually making a hole in the skull. So that's pretty cool, called temporal interference. But also the combination of genetics and light optogenetics and then the up conversion using infrared light of little nanoparticles to change how things go. And then combining, could you combine, you know, gene therapies with stimulation-based therapy? So there's a whole bunch of things that are being tried. And, and so I think it's uh, exciting to watch some of this unfold. And then I'll remind you that the neuroimmune system is one of the things that's so important um, to remember. And we think about immune responses. I showed you the repurposing of drugs to change the immune response when it dampens the immune response. Some of those people seem to get less Parkinson. And there has been a multi-year effort. It's not just in COVID-19 folks for developing neuroimmune approaches to Parkinson disease. And so this is a, uh, a quote from William Foch who says, uh, vaccines are the tugboats of preventative health. And if we look at this, you know, we can see that, um, that there are, um, you know, really interesting avenues that we can take because we know that there's this abnormal deposits of something called synuclein and Parkinson, among other things. And so could we program the immune system to go after that? Could we create antibodies and inject them to go after that? And even if we go after it, will it matter? Will we just clean up the brain and we'll still have Parkinson or will we clean up the brain and will it slow down the disease or will we clean up the brain? Will it cure the disease? Will we clean up the brain? Will it, uh, will it have some powerful symptomatic effect or will it have a side effect? We don't know, but there are multiple studies that are going on looking at the neuroimmune system. We think about horizon, think about cancer, think about other diseases, think about what we're learning in the animals. And we talk about optogenetically inspired deep brain stimulation. There's a number of great papers that have been out there looking at this by leading scientists in the world, combining genetics, engineering, optics, and light sensitive molecules. And when we can control those circuits, you say, well, I can't put this in the human troop. But if you can control the circuits and understand the circuits, you can better design the therapy. Also, if you're in cancer and you look in cancer things, cancer's developed designer receptors that are exclusively activated by designer drugs, the so-called DREAD technology. So we need to start to pull these things into Parkinson and think about how they can be useful. And finally, the development of biomarkers is really important. Not just a biomarker for diagnosis, that's actually probably less important, okay? But a biomarker for how the disease progresses that's super important. And so when we think about biomarkers, we need to think about it in that term. And this is one 
that's being looked at through 21 centers, including some Canadian centers through the Parkinson Study Group. Uh, this is Dave Valencourt and I and Angela Barampos uh, have a multi-center study looking at free water imaging. So if we could figure out how to track, diagnose, and then track Parkinson, diagnose first and then track Parkinson, we could reduce the number of patients we need in clinical trials from thousands to hundreds and think how many more things could we offer if we were able to do that. So with that, I will say thank you. You are welcome to tweet me. You're welcome to read our blog. This is my email address here. I'll leave up here for a minute if people want to want to write it down. I'm happy to interact with you and also very pleased uh, to be with you today in British Columbia in spirit and on the Zoom. And uh, I'm going to um, start by taking questions in the chat. So if you uh, will go ahead and type any question that you have in the chat, then, uh, then I'll be happy to, uh, to, to respond to it for you. And so let me um, here stop my screen share, come back in here, and, uh, and I'm just going to, uh, to, to go ahead and, and take the questions as we um, come, down the, uh, um, come down the thing. So there are some emails, there's some information from Alana and others and the Parkinson Society, and they have a weekly digest that you can, um, you can get uh, uh, emailed to you. Uh, the Aware and Care Kits, if you were interested when, uh, for hospitalization, uh, there is a link that is here. Thank you to Jean Blake for putting that link in for folks. I'll also mention that we have a, um, a, a, uh, a very nice uh, group of nurses. Back, I met with them today. I meet with them once uh, every month to go through all the difficult questions. It's a free hotline. I don't know if it's true in um, Canada, but in the U.S., free international hotlines are 1-800 numbers. And there are little numbers on the telephone, on the old fashioned telephones, those of you that, that know this. So 1-800, the number four PD info, or if you go to the Parkinson Foundation website, you'll see it's a free uh, nurse driven hotline and they'll answer any of your questions and any of the ones they can't answer, they usually will bring to our monthly chats, which I have really, really enjoyed. Um, one of the things that, um, that I wanted to do is also to thank everyone for, for your support of Parkinson's disease. I want you to stay involved and to take advantage of the PSBC programs and the services that you have locally. They're fantastic. You don't know how lucky you are to live in a region that has this organization and the ability for you to get information. Make sure you're subscribing to the PSBC Weekly Digest so you know what's available and it can help to improve awareness and advocacy. One of the most important things we tell people is tell your story, tell your story. It's super involved that you tell your story, that you get involved with campaigns. You can always contact PSBC for all of their support. The British Columbia community has support. The Parkinson Foundation has support. Other organizations also have support and are great. It's not just the Parkinson Foundation. And, um, and your groups recently added social workers and a health navigator position, which I talked about a bit in my talk and how important that is. And they can connect you to aware and care and, um, and give you advice. And so Alana Dillon is great and she can advise you on anything that you may need. Now, Athena Martens asks, uh, my father was diagnosed with Parkinsonism. We've tried levodopa three times now to significant dosages, but dad does not respond. Have any change in symptoms? Do we have any other options? We've been told DBS is not an option for him. So one of the things that we've learned, Athena, is that the response to dopamine is the single best predictor of whether DBS will work. Now, sometimes there's forms of Parkinson that don't respond to dopamine. They don't, in general, respond very well to deep brain stimulation. There's only very few exceptions to that rule. So that may not be the path. Although one of the things that I always tell people is, some of these other forms of Parkinsonism, assuming that's what it is, and I don't want to pretend I haven't seen your father before, but assuming that it is some cousin to Parkinson, sometimes they do respond to dopamine and maybe the stomach's not emptying. And so one of the things that, one of the tricks that we will often do is, is actually um, have uh, folks get what's called a gastric emptying study. It's where you get a, a prescription and you go to radiology. They have a section called nuclear medicine. They'll give you a little tag and they'll see how long it takes the tag to exit out of the stomach, okay? 
And, uh, and if it's delayed, you have gastric emptying problems. And if you speed those gastric emptying problems, you might get a better response. Some people, if they can tolerate it, can take an inhaler, uh, a, a, uh, an injection, an apomorphine injection to make sure that it's not the gastric system that's not uh, absorbing. And certainly you wanna to talk to your doctors um, about that. And then um, treat very aggressively the non-motor symptoms if you don't respond to dopamine at all and you're, and you're sure it's not a gastric absorption. So a lot of times we use drugs like Effexor that, that um, push up uh, levels of things like uh, serotonin and norepinephrine. So those are a few little tips that, um, that we have uh, um, found uh, useful. So the projected number of people with PD was at worldwide or just in the US. Those are worldwide numbers in the world's most populous country. So it doesn't quite include everyone. The World Health Organization has been tracking this. There's uh, some national disease tracking information. And Ray Dorsey is the author of those pictures that I showed that were out of our book. And he's the one that knows more than anybody that I know on the planet on this. But it, it is actually um, really shocking. Sometimes the numbers that we show show people over 50 and so they're there and we know parkinson can affect people below the age of 50 so a lot of people believe that they're under estimates how are arthritis rheumatic fever and parkinson disease related i have all three um okay well first of all arthritis according to the parkinson um the parkinson outcome project that's the, part of the national parkinson foundation it's the uh, largest real world study of parkinson uh, disease that's ever been conducted or ever been attempted. That particular study showed us that the most common comorbidity, that means that, you know, the um, most common um, uh, uh, symptom that is associated with Parkinson disease is arthritis. And it's, we believe that it's a comorbidity when it's osteoarthritis with your joints. And it might be that it's a little more common in Parkinson. Uh, because as you move and move in different ways or move less, you may develop a little bit more arthritis. We actually don't know completely the answer to that. So there hasn't been enough research. There's not a hard and fast connection. Now, some people believe that rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, these are autoimmune things, autoimmune forms of arthritis may have a relationship to Parkinson's disease and that the link might be the neuroimmune system and autoimmunity. Rheumatic fever, I'm not, I'm not aware of the link. I'll have to look that one up, but I'm pretty sure I can tell you, no, it is linked to another movement disorder called chorea or, or Sydenham's chorea, which is a dance-like disorder in children. Chris Andrews asks, does the age of onset affect the degree of, of progression and severity of PD symptoms? Chris, the answer is probably yes. You know, uh, one person is one person, but if you look at populations of people, younger onset Parkinson people <coughs> do better with certain therapies and have different symptoms and more neuropsychiatric symptoms. People that are more seasoned, I never say older, okay, especially as I'm getting older, people who are more seasoned, may have a slightly different course and there are different subtypes. And the answer is probably yes. What can I tell you about the sugar shift or sugar and Parkinson disease? Not much, except in the South, we call diabetes sugar, and there is a higher incidence of diabetes and Parkinson disease, particularly in, um, in type one and younger diabetics. Uh, what's the success rate for focused ultrasound laser treatments? Um, early days for Parkinson <clears throat> disease, so it seems to work pretty good for unilateral for tremor only, and early days to see how accurate it's gonna be for some of the other symptoms and whether it's gonna be safe for two-sided lesions. When we used to put two-sided lesions in the brain, we got into some issues with that and then how accurate it will be. Anything coming from outside the brain is a little less accurate than, than things inside. And sometimes millimeters matter, Maria. So, so stay tuned on that. Priscilla, um, you're impressed with my knowledge. I'm going to have you call my wife, Priscilla, and my kids and make sure you tell them. So, um, so thank you for your, um, your, uh, your kind compliment and uh, appreciate the ability to come in. I also appreciate Alana for being patient with me, getting me on the schedule with COVID-19 and everything that's going on on here to even get to your group. Uh, she's been uh, an all-star to make that happen. And because um, it, it's just been so crazy here, the craziest um, period in my career by far. And I'm sure this is true of everybody. 
Um, Susan Huber uh, read in a newspaper article, approximately 80% of Parkinson patients will eventually develop dementia. Is this accurate? It's a loaded question, Susan, because it depends on how you define dementia and, um, and different people define it in different ways. Everybody with Parkinson's disease is gonna get some problems with their frontal lobe and their memory in some aspect. We have what, what we call Parkinson superstars uh, or cognitive superstars. And when we do all those cognitive testing, they just do awesome on everything, but they're still a little bit impaired, even cognitive superstars. So not everybody gets flat out dementia. We don't know why. And then depending on how you measure it, if you, if you choose the, a cutoff that is very sensitive, it looks like everybody has it. If you choose a cutoff that's less sensitive, they don't. I kind of look at it more practically speaking. Most of my patients can, can read a book, can, can, you know, can go through the chapters one at a time. And that's one of the great cognitive tasks I love to um, have my own patients do or my own uh, persons with Parkinson that are here within my practice, listen to a book and make sure you can remember the chapter, talk about it, listen to it with somebody. If you both agree, you get it right, you go to the next chapter. Most people can do the functional working memory types of tasks they need to, to, uh, to be successful. And then people will say, don't, don't dual task. I actually say it the other way around. Try to monotask with Parkinson. Your brain will work better if you try to do one thing at a time. And as a human, you're always doing like six things at a time. Okay, but try to do one thing. So try to monotask better than thinking in the negative, don't do something, don't multitask, just say, try to monotask, try to focus on one thing at a time and you'll be more successful. So thanks for that question, uh, Susan. Uh, artificial intelligence will play a role in adaptive closed loop DBS. Hate to let the cat out of the bag, Elias, but it's already playing a role. And um, we've been training systems in our lab and other people that are defined, you know, strictly de defined by definition as smart computers that can encode things in real time faster than we can and put that device back into action. Uh, we do this a lot with, uh, with, with a disease called Tourette. It's also being done in Parkinson and, um, and other disorders. Uh, Diane, uh, several anxiety attacks uh, while I take menlothaxine for depression. Any suggestion for anxiety attacks? Um, tough one, uh, Diane. Two things. Uh, one, um, when you talk with your with your healthcare team, make sure you define whether you are an anxious type one person like me, just a little bit, you know, always got to have everything in order, a little bit OCD, a little type one. If you're like that before you had Parkinson, it amplifies after you have Parkinson. And some people even have something called generalized anxiety disorder that was there a little bit before Parkinson, you get Parkinson that worsens. That has a different approach to it than just Parkinson related anxiety. Parkinson-related anxiety, a lot of times, if you get the person on, move the dosages closer together. If venlafaxine is giving you side effects, go on to something different. There are other SNRIs, serotonin, norepinephrine uptake inhibitor. Just go to a straight SSRI, like, like, um, like something like uh, Zoloft or, or Prozac or one of those can be good. And the other thing that's been great for anxiety, and I, you know, I'm sorry if this offends people, but since 2015, we've been pretty interested and have written about cannabinoid receptors. And we've been using CBD oil and, and trying to get people to get safe, uh, um, you know, safe non-contaminated batches of CBD from uh, dispensers and CBD without the THC in it can be a very powerful anxiety. And even with the THC, if you're licensed or it's legal and you're um, domain can be a very powerful anti-anxiety uh, medication that's under uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, investigation, sort of at this time. So, uh, Vic wants to know: Is PD a disease of advancing civilization? Chemicals, in other words, a correlation between the number of PD sufferers and increased use of chemicals, electromagnetic radiation, etc. Bingo! Yes. We believe that it is. If you look all the way back to industrialization and pre-industrialization and the rates, and Ray Dorsey is the biggest advocate of this. He's in Rochester, New York, the lead author of ending Parkinson's disease. Do medical records of 100 years or more ago show people have Parkinson's disease? Yes, uh, they do, but in much lower numbers. And the numbers seem to be skyrocketing. In fact, Parkinson, Vic, I don't wanna scare you out of your chair. We don't fall out of your chair here, grab onto something it's actually growing faster than any other neurologic disorder, including Alzheimer's disease. So there may be more people with Alzheimer's, but Parkinson is growing faster. We should pay 
uh, attention to that. And um, the question about why tremors stop during sleep, that is an awesome question. Um, and, uh, and what about the brain makes tremors start immediately upon waking? We actually don't know that. It's one of the Nobel Prize winning questions that if you can answer that question early, you will probably get your prize in Stockholm. But I can tell you from a physiology standpoint, for 20 years, I've been giving people dopamine. If you wake up in the middle of the night, usually 1, 2, 3 a.m., it's usually somewhere around 1 or 2 a.m., and you can't get back to sleep, instead of giving them sleep aids and, and making them tired the next day, I've had them redosing their Parkinson medications. I now know because we see the physiology in real time of people we've implanted with deep brain stimulators that the oscillation in the brain called the beta oscillation in some people, as the medicine wears off, even in the middle of the night, the beta oscillation comes up and the Parkinson comes back and it wakes them up and they can't get back to sleep unless you take your medicines. So there's something uh, about the sleep-wake cycle we don't completely understand, but, but that is a good trick. So you don't have to use really sedating medicines like clonazepam in a lot of uh, people. How do you know it's the best time to get DBS? Is better earlier than later? I'll direct you to, we have a, a nice free thing Alana can connect you with at the Parkinson Foundation. We've got a really nice uh, book. In fact, it's just been updated and the update will come out soon about DBS and all surgical therapies. There is a study in the New England Journal of Medicine showing if you have Parkinson and you're around 50 years old, so you get it when you're young, 50 or below, DBS could be good. But earlier is a loaded term. You have to be careful what that means. Earlier doesn't always mean like right after diagnosis. A lot of times earlier means after you develop motor fluctuations and people misunderstand that. So make sure you're talking to your docs and you talk to an experienced team. Um, Duopa pump in the last year, Terrence Gorsuch got it. It's helped tremendously, absolutely. Uh, again, you get people to turn on and stay on. This can be great. During the 16 hours that it's approved, at least in the US to be on, you don't need to be taking other Parkinson medications. So this can be a great therapy for keeping people on. Uh, Roberta Mullen says, I get cankers in my mouth when I take carbidopa, levodopa. The drugs help my symptoms, but my mouth hurts. That's really interesting. I, I, I don't know that I've seen that specifically, and I'm not sure if it's related. I have seen that with amantadine uh, before, but if it is carbidopa, levodopa, you might try a different formulation and a different color pill. Sometimes if it has yellow dye number five or number six, uh, and, and people, particularly if you have an aspirin allergy, Roberta, sometimes you can have an allergy to the yellow dye. And so if you get blue pill, sometimes that goes away. So I don't know on that one, but, uh, but you might want to talk to your doc about that. Numbness in your legs and PD is not common. It's usually um, spinal stenosis or neuropathy or something else. Uh, thanks, Desmond. Katoon, a car accident in 2016, whiplash on the right side of my head. Signs of PD started showing up. Could this have brought up PD? Um, Katoon, usually no. Usually what happens is um, that the stress and anxiety of the car accident brought out the Parkinson disease that was there anyway. So, um, so it was probably there anyway. And sometimes medications can unmask it. William uh, Ronsley, is there an audiobook or ebook format of living with Parkinson's disease? Um, there is an ebook format. An audiobook, I'm not sure. I know our 10 Secrets to a Happier Life book was uh, read by an NPR, a famous NPR host. Um, and I know that there's an audio book uh, by a British host, a really good British host for ending Parkinson, but I can check with the publisher on that and, and maybe Alona and I can connect uh, on that one on the other, other side. Vicky, thank you for the, uh, for the comment. And uh, Victor Flagg, any of the emerging therapies like optical nano available in BC, are they covered in BC? No, these are all research. This is the hope right now. None of those therapies are yet um, ready for, for, uh, for prime time. Restless leg syndrome, Desmond, is common with Parkinson's disease, very common. And then last question, Vicki Greeley, could the patch reticotine be causing my excessive itching? Absolutely, if it's around the area that you put the patch on. And so we rotate the patch around. If your local itching is around the area that the patch is and when you move it, you see that, then it could be the, the patch that's causing it. Okay, Alana, I'm gonna turn it back to you. I think we're about 10 minutes over time, but I think we got everybody's questions answered. You're welcome to, uh, to, you know, to, to log on and, 
catch me on Twitter. I'll put my Twitter handle in here if you, if you want to check out any of our conversations. Also, our blog, I'll put that in, parkinsonsecrets.com. So back to you, Alana. Uh, Dr. Oaken, thank you so much for such an informative and interesting presentation. Again, really appreciate you joining us today to share your expertise. And um, also thank you all for attending today's talk and for your questions. Uh, we will see you at our next talks in the Global Symposium series on May 11th and 20th with Alex Curtin and Dr. Strafella. Thanks again, Dr. Oaken. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye now. Thank you, everyone. Live a great life. Make every day your best day.